What you're seeing here is the start of a wildfire. And in this simulation, the fire is not far from a residential community. Now, if you asked me if I felt like these homes were in danger, I would have said, probably not. Because a few years ago, I saw flames just like these dangerously close to my family home. But California firefighters working day and night ensured that not a single home was lost in our community. Because of that experience, I came to think that fire is something that we can essentially control. The so-called great fires of the past are something you'd only find in a history book. But all of my assumptions changed in the first weeks of January. Out of control wildfire exploding overnight in the Los Angeles area. Hurricane force winds reached upwards of 100 miles per hour. 100,000 people had been forced from their homes. My whole city gone, man, the whole thing. As you can see, there's nothing left, and I really can't put it into words. The catastrophic potential of wildfires has become all too obvious to us here in Los Angeles. As of recording this video, these fires have burned through 60 square miles, or 155 square kilometers, of LA County. To put that into perspective, that's 30,000 football fields. And on the day when the flames were at their worst, it was burning through seven and a half of those fields a minute. Now, some of this area was wildlands that we've seen experience wildfire before, but the property damage that was caused by these recent fires shocked the entire nation. At least 16,000 structures, many of which were homes, were simply erased. Despite growing up in California and being aware of the threat of wildfires, I've realized that I have almost no understanding of how they actually function. I mean, I get that a big fire is dangerous, obviously, but I could not believe the rate at which those fires tore through entire neighborhoods. And now that the flames have died down, all I can think is, how could this happen in 2025? Why was it so hard to fight? Well, in order to answer these questions, I'm gonna use my skills in computer graphics to build a basic simulation of a wildfire. In it, I can isolate each contributing variable. That way we can see what role different environmental factors had in creating the uniquely catastrophic LA wildfires. But in order to simulate the macro level phenomena of fire, we first need to understand the micro level mechanics. And to help me do that, I reached out to an expert in fire science and mechanics, Professor Rory Haddon. So Rory, when a piece of wood or other vegetation actually ignites, what is going on? On really the chemical level, it's actually quite simple. We need some fuel, we need some oxygen, and we need some heat. If you've ever watched a piece of wood burning kind of close up, you see that the flame is actually not touching the wood. The reason for that is because solids, in general, don't actually burn. You have to first turn that solid into a vapor, and that requires a ton of heat. Once it's turned into a gas, it can then mix with the air that's around it, and if there's enough heat from that exhaust, that spark, those gases will ignite. The burning of a plant creates this wicked soup of flammable gases, which, by the way, is also what you smell when you smell that kind of characteristic fire smell. But before those gases can be ignited, water vapor is the first thing that we'll get. Of course, that doesn't burn. And in fact, actually, that is a pretty good way of stopping fires, as we, as we all know. If you build a campfire with wet wood versus dry wood, right, you spend forever trying to get it going with the wet wood. It will eventually catch and it will go, but it's much less impressive. Some plant species vaporize a bunch of water and that helps keep them cool and it helps stop them burning quite as much. So humidity is super important in vegetation fires, the moisture in the natural world. It's what we saw in LA a year ago, you had pretty heavy rains and that promotes a lot of vegetation growth. And then you guys entered like a drought period. So I think it was eight months since you had some rain. So loads of that vegetation dies off in that time. And the moisture content of that dead vegetation is entirely determined by the moisture content of the atmosphere around it. So if the humidity is really low, there is that risk of a wildfire. So I've built my simulated wildfire scenario and it's gonna help us visualize some of the concepts that Rory is explaining. This scene is full of vegetation, AKA fuel. And when that fuel reaches its ignition temperature, it will start to burn. And that burn will start to spread to all of the neighboring fuel around it. Now, one of the major contributing factors to this spread is this idea of diffusion. How easily or quickly can the neighboring fuel sources ignite or heat up, reaching that triggering threshold of burn? This is essentially humidity. And in this initial simulation, we're imagining high humidity, a lush spring forest. Well, that doesn't look too bad, right? It's creeping, it's definitely making progress, but it's not catching many of these trees on fire. 
and it feels like something that we could stop if we could get teams up there. But what happens when we remove that humidity? Like eight months of drought might do. Wow, and already it's looking so much faster. Now you'll notice the fire isn't just spreading faster to the surrounding fuel because it's easier to ignite. It's actually burning hotter, which is lighting up a lot of the surrounding vegetation, the trees and the bushes, which are typically a little harder to ignite. We can already see just with this one factor alone, this fire has got a lot more dangerous. Okay guys, we're gonna take a pause there for a second to thank the sponsor of this video. Our sponsors give us the ability to make these kinds of videos here on YouTube, so we give a very special thank you to today's sponsor, Manscaped. <laughs> I could make a very tasteless comparison about how we need to groom our personal forests by trimming all that dead foliage, but I won't do that because Manscaped isn't for clearing wildlands, it's for trimming your beard and balls. <laughs> And with their beard and balls bundle, you can take care of your face and everything else too. This bundle features the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra, an advanced trimmer with a dual LED spotlight, and two interchangeable skin safe blade heads. One for trimming and one for a completely smooth foil shave. It's also waterproof, so you can groom in the shower. Also included in the bundle is the Beard Hedger, built with a titanium coated T-blade and an adjustable zoom wheel, offering 20 different lengths. It's also waterproof, has 60 minutes of runtime, and includes a travel bag and length setting comb. This bundle offers precision, versatility, and convenience in your grooming. You can get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use code CORRIDORCREW at manscaped.com. Again, that's 20% off plus free shipping with code CORRIDORCREW at manscaped.com. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Now, back to this simulation. Now, drought is not something that's new to us here in Los Angeles. It's something we've battled on and off for a very long time. But on the night when all those fires started, one thing that really stood out was the hurricane strength winds. That scenario with those Santa Ana winds, you couldn't engineer a better system to drive a wildfire, the wind. It does two things. The first thing it does is we've got to heat up the fuel ahead of where the flames are for the fire to spread. The wind pushes the flames over, it tilts them. And that just means there's more flame, you can see more of the fuel that's on the ground. Also, it stretches the flames, flammable gases. They just get blown. So instead of burning in this location, now there's wind, so they're moving and they're gonna burn over here. And then the next head is burning over there. So you just, you kind of stretch out the whole flame. So now you've got a much bigger area of vegetation that can be heated. The other thing the wind does is it dries out vegetation super fast. We had a project a few years ago and we measured fuel moisture drying out from the kind of maximum fuel moisture content to being dry enough to burn in 30 minutes under a dry and pretty intense wind. So eight months of drought, that didn't help. But when you've got this really low humidity coupled with these really strong winds, it's like a perfect combination to spread a fire quickly. You can see that when we add these historic winds, we're hitting speeds that you would have trouble outrunning. These flames are much larger, drying out larger portions of the surrounding vegetation. This is creating a raging inferno that is very quickly getting out of control. But you'll notice, even with all this increased energy, the fire can't advance beyond the road because the road is the end of the fuel line. Therefore, the fire simply uses up what fuel it has left and all fizzles out and dies. When you've got a wildfire approaching a community, it's kind of interesting if we think of the fire itself as like a line or a wall of flames. When that hits a community, it kind of breaks up, right? If you've got a good road to stop the fire, you will just cut off its fuel supply and you'll slow that right down. It's, it's pretty crazy because about five years ago, we had another wildfire up in Azusa that was started very near my family home. And I was just working away. Uh, my mom was downstairs and she got a ring on the door. And so she went to the door and it was the neighbor and they were hysterical. They were screaming, there's a massive fire on the way. And she ran up the stairs to get my attention. And I came outside and by the time I came outside, I was hit with the wall of heat of the entire mountainside, just a road away, just one road distance, all of it being ignited. And I was watching it spread across the mountainside. It never got our house because of that road in between. I guess we just got lucky. But one thing we didn't have during that fire was 100 mile per hour winds, which spread the fire in all the ways we've been talking about, but also churn up flurries of embers, which created some of the most terrifying images on the news. 
Embers are the bad guys, right? Really in these in these fires. They don't care about roads. The embers are nothing other than a piece of burning material and it can come from anything. A tree, a shrub, a burning structure. They get generated at the rates of hundreds or thousands per meter of fire line. They will travel ahead of the fire front, you know, hundreds of meters. They will travel sometimes miles. A lot of them don't do very much, but we know you get unlucky, one firebrand can be enough to start a new fire. And that's a huge deal if you're fighting this wildfire, because you think you're fighting a fire that's in front of you, but all of a sudden now there's a fire behind you. Firebrand, sometimes you think, oh, it's a few inches maximum, but you get huge firebrands. Sometimes these things are the size of surfboards. I mean, they are the leading cause by far for structure ignitions. And it's really sad because it's almost like a lottery if your house is going to be hit. And we see that, right? You see these kind of miracle homes or whatever that avoided it. Now the fire with wind is dangerous enough, but now you have this element that is simply jumping fire breaks and starting entirely new fires in areas that I wouldn't have even expected to be in danger. So now I have to run multiple iterations of this simulation because the fire spits off embers and those embers start a new fire, which spit off embers and start a new fire. And very quickly, even on my end, it's gotten out of control. So you'll get an ember landing in some ornamental vegetation that's next to a wall. You can ignite the sidings, decking, roofing materials, and then they'll ignite the structure. And once you get a structure ignited, it's a whole different ballgame. Because if you look at the amount of flammable materials in a home compared to the wildland area, it's way more. Anything plastic is going to have about double the energy that's released when something burns compared to anything you find in the natural world, what we call heat of combustion. And our homes are full of this stuff. Homes, once they ignite, they burn like crazy, right? And you've still got that wind. You've still got that wind driving firebrands. So one home ignites, and then the next structure gets a shower of firebrands, and then the next structure. And actually you go, not really from a wildfire event, but to an urban conflagration. You know, it's called a wildfire in the media, but it's not really the wildfire that's burning at that point. It is one home igniting the next structure, igniting the next structure. The, the demand on the water service is enormous. The water service can't keep up. As structures get damaged or destroyed, the water pipelines break and water is just pouring out onto the, the streets and the firefighters don't have enough water because it was never designed to fight more than, you know, one fire on a city block at once. What options do we have for actually stopping the spread of wildfires? Once these fires start, it's really kind of impossible to put them out, right? A lot of what is called firefighting is actually doing things quite remote from the fire itself. Crews will be out and they will be on the fire line with hand tools, with power tools, cutting down trees, removing fuel to try and reduce the intensity of the fire as it passes through an area. Another quite common technique where it's safe to do it is back burning. So that is literally starting a deliberate line of fire that's going to progress towards the large fire front. And as it progresses in a slow controlled manner, it will consume the fuel. And that means when the large wildfire hits it, there's much less or nothing available to burn. Probably the most high profile, most visual techniques that they use are those huge aircraft dumping water on the, the landscape. It's a really difficult job. Sometimes you see it's a perfect drop and the water hits exactly where it needs to. Other times it's not such a bullseye. I'm not criticizing. I could never do that job. It's just, it's obviously quite difficult to get the water where you need it. Look at this simulation after we've factored everything in and how quickly the fire overtakes this entire scene. This is by far to me the most sobering thing to look at. As Rory said, and as we saw in LA, fighting fires becomes almost impossible when it reaches this level of chaos. Looking at the overwhelming coverage of these embers, it almost feels like there's nothing you can do. We're kind of left at the mercy of nature. There is no such thing as a natural disaster. Nature is nature. You can't fight it, you can't change it. Right? Nature will do what nature does. The disasters are all human disasters. One variable we haven't discussed, maybe the most critical one of all, is us. And to help me understand our responsibility in spreading wildfires globally, I reached out to Rachel Lohman, who has a PhD in forest ecology and studies disturbances in the ecosystem. What direct effect do humans have in starting these wildfires? 
Globally, it's something in the 95, 96% of wildfires come from human ignitions. Most commonly things like escaped campfires, down power lines, cigarettes, arson. Human ignitions have become more likely because we're still in a period of expansion of urban areas out into the wildlands, the areas of natural fuels. And that's where we can see wildfires that have devastating ecological or cultural impacts. Even though we see the emergence of large wildfires, we also are living in a time of fire deficit because there has been a big effort over the past hundred years to suppress fires, and that has resulted in a change in the fuel structure. So we have a forest that might be more dense than they were in the past. Instead of having widely spaced canopies, now we have canopies that are very tightly packed so fire can spread easily from one to the other. And so we have all of this fuel accumulation and all of that fuel is existing in conditions that are hotter and drier than it was in the past. So things like extreme fire weather events, like strong winds that are sort of outside of the historical norms, which come from differences in heating between land surface and ocean surface. They're heating more than they did in the past. And so that can create these strong wind events, but then also very intense rainfall followed by periods where there's no rainfall at all. So now we have literally this perfect storm where we have lots and lots of fuel that is very ready to burn. So we built this enormous continuous campfire all around us. Now, when it comes to these big fires, we've talked about the direct impact of the flames themselves, but what about all the byproducts of that fuel that's being burned, like the carbon dioxide? in Canada in 2023, which is a really big year for wildfires. The amount of CO2 emitted from those wildfires was 480 megatons of carbon, which that's comparable in magnitude to the amount of fossil fuel emissions that might have come from an industrialized country that year. So oh, wow. a big wildfire year in a region can emit a sizable amount of CO2 but the emissions of CO2 can be balanced by uptake of CO2. Plants globally take up CO2 from the atmosphere, and so reforestation or regrowth of vegetation can start to balance out emissions from wildfire. It's always important to recognize that most biomes across the globe are adapted to some level of fire. Fire has had a role in the development of ecosystems, like nutrient cycling, creating patchiness in landscapes that can really enhance biodiversity. Some ecosystems are adapted to frequent enough fire so that some of their growth is stimulated by fires. One of the really important ecological benefits of fire is just reducing the risk of future catastrophic or extreme or severe wildfires. So one of the, the treatments is to remove some of those fuels from those dense landscapes. And therefore, a fire that may occur during an unplanned time in the future could have a much less devastating ecological impact. Humans have lived on this planet for a really long time, and indigenous peoples for thousands or tens of thousands of years had a strong program of intentional purposeful use of fire as a means of reducing fire risk on landscapes around communities. So the role of people in interacting with fire is a, is a very old one. If humans lived with fire, manipulated fire, worked with fire for all of these millennia, I mean, it should give us some hope that we can learn to do the same thing again. There are a lot of big picture solutions to help mitigate future wildfires, but those things take time. Something we can all do right now is directly help those who have been affected by the LA wildfires. Check out the links in the description of this video to see what you can do to help. Thanks for watching.